Thank you, uh, Linda. Um, I dropped my mic lapel. My mom's here. I'm really nervous. That's one of the reasons. <laughs> so um, it's a small crowd, so it's fairly informal. And uh, there are some old friends from the 100 Grannies, for example. Um, so I, I wanted to uh, talk about connecting Iowa to the developing world. Um, you know, often we even have a store, the Reagan store uh, on the Ped Mall that's devoted to the fact that Iowa is uh, typically confused with Idaho and Ohio and uh, sort of is missed when people fly over the country. Uh, but I wanted to point out some things that Iowa has done um, in recent times, also in the past, that are very key to uh, the progress of developing countries. Uh, so. Uh, in particular, uh, I'm going to focus on uh, three items here, food, uh, water, and energy. Uh, I mostly am um, uh, an energy person, uh, but uh, there are lots of activities on campus. If you look at IAHR, the Hydro Science Institute, or SIGRER, uh, they do a lot with food and water. So I was pretty well uh, connected to issues surrounding these three things. Uh, and our particular group, so I speak for a particular group, uh, and it's an interdisciplinary group consisting of faculty from across the campus, uh, from uh, women and gender studies, uh, urban and regional planning, geography, history, uh, anthropology, and anthropology as well. It's somehow the label is missing. But it's a bunch of us that have been working together for now about five years. Um, so talking about lots of issues connected with this particular triangle. So I will sort of develop on this theme of food, water, energy and how uh, problems in the developing countries in these three areas tend to be extremely multidisciplinary and cross-cut across disciplines. Uh, so two central themes, this particular triangle of food, water, energy, and the second triangle, which is teaching research service, uh, showing how multidimensional these problems can be and how we've been, at least our group, has been really involved in getting students out there at all levels, graduate students, undergraduates, uh, involving faculty across campus, uh, NGOs, field workers, sort of the whole mix of trying to solve uh, problem, real problems in the world. Uh, but this is not a new venture. Uh, Iowa has, uh, of course, significantly transformed the world through this one person. Uh, uh, so Norman Borlaug, you all know, are familiar with Norman Borlaug. Um, and of course, uh, you know, he changed uh, India quite a bit through what is called in India the Green Revolution. Um, and uh, so I'm going to show you some, just to make it uh, real, uh, some uh, clips from newspapers in India. So when uh, Borlaug died in 2009, this was reporting in the Indian newspaper. Uh, he's called Indian, uh, India's Annadatta, which, is, which means the giver of food. So uh, he launched the Green Revolution, and India went from being an importer of food to now a net exporter of food. And, food self-sufficiency was achieved a few years ago, and now we export food. So that all uh, centers around Borlaug. Um, it's funny, his description here is interesting. Enter Norman Borlaug, so he's like a you know, mythical character, a strapping, self-made, sunburnt American from the farmland of Iowa, uh, who had spent more than a decade by then in Mexico, and then successfully helped India to become a full food self-sufficient uh, country. So, that's Borlaug right there. Um, and of course, there are uh, the second notable con contribution in that sort of regard is uh, Dr. Ponsetti from our own UIHC. Uh, Pons uh, Clubfoot is a huge problem uh, in India, massive numbers of people. And typically in India, uh, things like clubfoot, even cleft lips, for example, can uh, sort of uh, you know, subject the person who is suffering from that to a lifetime of misery. And so it's so important for uh, the treatment. Uh, and uh, actually, I'll show you a PBS clip which uh, brings home the fact that Iowa is really important and has contributed in this regard. Um, I believe there is going to be a brief. On American experience. Um, 
if you wanted to improve your lot, America was the place. Sorry, there's an advertisement, an but um, it will go away soon, hopefully. Gilded has the sense of a patina covering something else. If we just get through. Are we two nations, the poor and the wealthy, or are we one nation where everybody has a chance to succeed? The Gilded Age on American Experience. Next, bringing help to developing countries for a widely untreated birth defect. Fred de Sam Lazaro has a report from India's commercial capital, Mumbai, on a condition called club foot. It's part of his ongoing series, Agents for Change. It only sounds painful. This wailing five-year-old is receiving the very same treatment, a full-leg plaster cast, as this young, perfectly happy infant. The therapy here in Mumbai's Wadia Charitable Hospital will save these children from a life of pain and social isolation that comes from club foot. It's a common birth defect that in wealthy countries is usually corrected early in life. But in the developing world, it remains largely untreated and becomes a disability, says orthopedist Dr. Alaric Arugis. It is probably the second or the third important cause of physical disability in India after road traffic accidents and uh, trauma. It's more of a cosmetic problem initially. And as they grow older and they find that they can no longer play with their friends, that's when it, it, it starts sinking in that this is a functional problem as well. Clubfoot is a congenital birth defect in which a foot, in some cases both feet, grow inward. Patients learn to walk on the side of the foot. 26-year-old Madhu Varma says it's painful for sustained periods, but like most sufferers, she learned to adapt. What she could not deal with was the sight of her daughter, Madhuri, when she too was born with clubfoot. It was really difficult. I cried for days when I saw my child's foot. I couldn't eat. I was just sick with worry. But they told me that with plaster, they could treat it. So this is the daughter and this is the mother. And the daughter's foot is fully corrected. That correction once required extensive surgery, Dr. Aruja says. Now, treatment in most cases is a series of casts over several weeks, less invasive, less expensive, and less painful. It's such a supple method, we don't force the foot in any way at all. So as you can see that every time we move the foot just as much as the child allows. This is a procedure which is done without any anesthetic. Once corrected, patients like five-year-old Nishant wear a brace attached to an outward-facing pair of shoes. In a few months, as in this case, it's only needed at night and nap time. Nishant shows no signs of abnormal gait. His parents, struggling slum dwellers, spent hundreds of dollars at ill-equipped and poorly informed private clinics with little success. We had never heard of Clubfoot until he was born. We felt terrible, but when we brought him to Mumbai, two or three people told me that Wadia Hospital has the best treatment. That treatment was developed by an orthopedic surgeon named Ignacio Ponsetti, half a world away here in Iowa and half a century ago. It would take decades before the Ponsetti method became standard practice for treating clubfoot. Why do you suppose it took as long as it did? One, I think, is, is that the kinds of people that were treating clubfoot, at least in the US, were orthopedic surgeons. Um, and I think they became surgeons for a reason. They liked doing surgery. And this was introducing a non-surgical technique. Um, and I think there was some resistance to that. Cheska Colorado Mansfeld, a business consultant, lived in Iowa City, where Ponsetti, a Spanish immigrant, was a local legend. Dr. Ponsetti's dying wish, he was in his 90s at that time, was to try to get his treatment out to the rest of the world. Colorado Mansfeld started one of several nonprofit efforts to fulfill Dr. Ponsetti's wish to take the non-surgical approach, finally standard in the U.S., to developing countries. She co-founded a charity in 2010 called Miracle Feet, supported mostly by high net worth individuals and foundations. It's taken the Ponsetti method and message to clinics in 19 countries so far, with some 23,000 patients, including those in Mumbai, providing training and supplies at low or no cost, including braces patients will use after their cast treatments are done. So that's you know another way in which Iowa literally has left a footprint on the world. Um, 
Of course, what we are doing is much smaller, and <laughs> probably will not have as much of an impact as Dr. Ponsetti's work. Um, but what we are trying to do is, uh, in our interdisciplinary group, is bring together these two triangles of looking at food energy, water nexus problems, uh, and then blending in what we do as faculty, which is teaching research and service, into uh, projects in the developing world. We have uh, work in India and Ghana and Kenya that we are uh, moving forward with people uh, at those places. So uh, let me start by showing this picture to you. Uh, this is something that is in the news now, uh, in this season, and has been in the news for a few years. This is air pollution in New Delhi, India. This is what it looks like. Um, and uh, this, has hap this happens in the winter. Uh, if you fly into New Delhi and the, happen to fly in, usually your flights are going to be delayed. If not, you will end up in, a tr in traffic like this with, with uh, almost very low visibility. Um, this is reminiscent, of course, uh, in every de developing situation. Uh, when you look at, for example, uh, London, England in 1952, uh, the great smog uh, which almost uh, led to the uh, demise of uh, Winston Churchill's government in the second when he came after the war. Um, if you watch the uh, television series The Crown, you will see that portrayed there. He almost lost his job because of this smog. Um, it was a really bad smog. 12,000 people died in the smog. And the reason for it was a combination of uh, you know, still atmosphere, a lot of burning of wood and coal to keep people warm in the winter, uh, thermal inversion effects, and lots of other atmospheric dynamics. But this is what countries go through. You will see these kind of images from Beijing, from Harbin, you know, all the cities, uh, growing cities in China, for example. So uh, air pollution like this is really uh, leads to cancellation of schools and other things, uh, a stoppage of work in, in Delhi. Uh, it has, of course, severe health impacts, right? Here's somebody trying to run with a mask on. The mask does not protect the person from anything. Um, and if you look at uh, in numbers, how bad is it? Uh, if you look at uh, this particular week in November, uh, typically there are air quality indexes for various, uh, you know, uh, that uh, uh, people keep track of. Uh, good air quality is right there. This is where we are in Iowa. We are somewhere down here. Uh, and uh, Los Angeles could be somewhere up here, uh, uh, approaching 100. Uh, 100. These are parts per million of what's called P2.5. So 2.5 micron particles, uh, parts per million of that. Right. So these are very, very tiny particles. You cannot see them. Uh, hum just as comparison, human hair diameter is about 50 microns. So 2.5 is much smaller than human hair diameter. And you can see where Delhi is, right? It's, it's way off the charts. This is not, there is no actually, the chart ends here at 500, uh, because that's beyond his orders, right? Uh, so it's, oh, these are like life-threatening uh, levels of pollution. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, so what uh, the newspapers in India, I want to show you newspapers just to uh, make sure that we know that these are current problems uh, that is, uh, that people are talking about all the time in Delhi. So given the severity of air pollution, there is no non-smoker in India. Right? Everybody's smoking. Um, and in New Delhi, a person typically smokes about between 16 and 40 cigarettes a day, depending, depending on, on the air quality, right? so on a regular basis. Um, and uh, the thing is that most of these things are not just particulate carbon. There is also mercury in the air. Uh, and other, actually, uh, uh, not just mercury, but other um, very dangerous uh, substances. Uh, where does mercury come from? Most of it comes from thermal power plants or coal burning power plants because coal is dug from under the ground. There are all sorts of other things mixed in with coal. It's never pure. And so when you burn that, the mercury goes up into the air. Uh, and in fact, the mercury will get into the trees. So when you burn wood, you are also getting mercury out of the wood. So uh, all of this comes out into the atmosphere. People are breathing mercury uh, and lead, of course, right? And those kinds of things. Uh, so, you know, it's, the situation is so desperate that this is something that I read in the newspaper. Delhi tests water cannons to combat deadly air pollution. Essentially, they, they install water cannons. I'll show you a picture. And then just try to shoot the particles down with water cannons, right? I mean, this is. Uh, absurd, correct? <laughs> okay, it's, it's really, uh, this apparently, uh, this technique was uh, 
tried in China, and then it, it was exported to India. So people are just trying to shoot these particles out. Um, because typically the droplets will carry the particles down, but it's a very local thing, even if it works, it's local. But this is an extreme measure, right? It's absurd. Uh, of course, absurdity is a, is a response uh, to extreme conditions, a desperate measure. Uh, if you think about what we are doing, for example, uh, in the United States, we have all the CO2 in the air, and one of the things that people are now working on is to pull CO2 from the air, right? To suck up the CO2 back, okay? This is called carbon, clean coal. That's what clean coal is, is to suck the carbon out of the, uh, out of the air. That's absurd, uh, if you think about it. Why put it in there in the first place and then try to suck it out? Uh, but this is what people do when they run out of ideas and just are desperate. So that's how bad the situation is. Uh, and this dovetails with some of the uh, research that I'm going to talk about. So this is uh, uh, just looking at it from, this, from a satellite. This is how it would look. That's the haze that you see right here, this whole region out there. Uh, and Delhi, New Delhi is right in the middle of that haze. Um, so if you look at Delhi, this is aerosol depth, so the amount of particulates in the air, and Delhi is right there, right? And uh, so this whole region. So basically here are the Himalayas, Himalaya range here. So what happens is all this atmospheric dynamics just pushes these pollutants towards the Himalayas, and it stopped there. So there's this huge haze that collects, right? So it's, it's all over the place, all over North India. So um, a major reason for this haze, there are many, many reasons. Uh, coal burning power plants, um, uh, cement industries now because of growing construction. India is growing at about 7% uh, uh, GDP growth rate, right? Highest in the world. China is about 6.5 now. Uh, so they have switched places. So it's, it's a huge growth rate. So lots of construction and, and bricks and so on. So brick kilns operating. If you drive to Delhi uh, from Agra where the Taj Mahal is, you will see it lined up on the side of this highway or brick kiln after brick kiln or brick kiln, right? All burning wood and throwing a lot of uh, soot into the air. That's, those are the main development has its consequences. Now, uh, but 60% of the haze has been calculated uh, to be due to this process where uh, it's called stubble burning of crops. So uh, in northern India, there are two harvests, right? There's a winter harvest and a spring harvest. Or, uh, yeah. So this winter harvest is the one that happens before uh, the winter season, right? And what they've, they've harvested everything, and whatever is left on the ground is burnt to prepare for the next sowing. So uh, this is when they're burning the crops on the ground. It's called stubble burning. Um, and uh, so that's a major source of air pollution, outdoor air pollution in northern India, right? Add to this indoor air pollution, which comes from burning wood in uh, stoves to cook and for heating purposes, right? So the combination of these two things implies that there's a lot of biomass being burnt in India. Right? Millions and hundreds of millions of tons of biomass being burnt, and all that goes into the air, correct? So, so there's a combination of this outdoor air pollution and indoor air pollution. Uh, and the indoor air pollution itself is actually uh, quite uh, you know, hazardous in itself. It amounts to a woman or child smoking two packets of cigarettes a day, all right? just for cooking. Uh, and it can be either, actually, this is fairly clean. You can see all the soot back there and so on. Uh, but this is actually fairly clean uh, because this is actually burning wood. While here, they can be even worse if you're burning, for example, just raw biomass, or you could be burning dung. right? Uh, and this goes all the way into the Himalayas. And then in Nepal, for example, they burn yak dung. right? And that's really, really terribly polluting and can lead to severe respiratory problems. And women will typ typically, of course, hold their infants while they're cooking. So uh, you get a lot of these, uh, the pollution. So this is indoor air pollution. Um, let me play you a little clip that one of our collaborators, Donna Cleveland, took uh, in our work site when we were in India, highlighting the problem. <laughs>
it's, it's a massive problem, right? The scale of the problem is, is really large. In India alone, there are uh, 700 million people who, who eat daily meals cooked on firewood. And in the world, about 3 billion. So it's a large chunk of indoor air pollution is coming from just cooking activities, right? So there's outdoor air pollution in the urban areas and indoor air pollution in the rural areas. Uh, so uh, we've been trying to tussle with this problem and also trying to do not just research, but trying to involve students from Iowa uh, in the teaching and service activities so they get some perspective on what's happening in, in the developing world. Um, so uh, the particular region uh, where we are working is Rajasthan. It's uh, a, west, a state in the west of India. And uh, the state is peculiar because there's a hill range here. And on the other half, the half of it is just desert. And the hill range prevents the desert from coming over into the rest of the state. Um, and this, when you go this, in this direction, you're going towards Delhi, which is somewhere out there, and then to the Himalayas, which are somewhere out here. So this is the region of interest in northern India. Um, so if you look at, uh, originally when we went there uh, to try to start uh, looking at the problem, the event in about 2010, I took a bunch of students uh, looking at the deforestation issue on the hills over there. And deforestation has been going on. If you look at the picture in 1972 and 2000, you can see that the loss of forest cover, so there's rampant deforestation. And my original thought was that deforestation is happening because of uh, firewood collection, right? So the question that we were trying to solve was, how do we go from this, this is a picture of the hills with the forests, uh, to that, where the hills are completely denuded of forest, right? And our original impression given by the NGO there was, it's because of these women, right? That they're harvesting the firewood. Of course, I was terribly naive. I, I'm an engineer, so I don't know, I, you know, I cannot think very clearly in general. So, um, unless they're numbers. And so I went there under the impression that these women were clear cutting the entire forest. Um, and that's where I started working on this problem. Uh, so you can see that you know, we, we did due diligence. We went and followed the women through their day. And you can see that uh, you know, uh, the evolution of their day from 7 AM when they wake up and cook. And then they go off into the forest, and they're harvesting firewood. Uh, they're carrying these huge loads on their heads. Uh, and then they bring it back over these hills okay, for several hours. Uh, and this is throughout the year, right? Uh, no, um, no let up, no weekends, nothing. This is happening uh, every single day. And uh, then they, you know, this is still coming towards home. And then there's a whole collection of firewood for the day, right? It's uh, about 75, 70 pounds of uh, firewood, about 10 feet tall. Uh, I don't know how they carried it over those hills because I cannot, I could not even move that bundle, right? Uh, and actually, you know, I'm not a terribly huge, uh, sp uh, great specimen of human, um, you know, uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, strength. So I later on persuaded some of my colleagues who appeared to be more strong than I was to budget, and they could not budget either. So these women are carrying these things for miles and miles over hills. How they do it, I have no idea. Uh, and then, of course, they come back and they cook. Uh, and so one of the early pro thoughts I had was we, perhaps this deforestation problem could be solved if we can uh, prevent them from cutting the firewood, right? And so I put my uh, engineering mind, uh, such as it is, to work. And um, one of the things that is obvious is that the region where we are here operating is in a region of high solar flux. It's in the tropics, so high solar flux. So we imagine that we could use that solar power to build solar cookers, and then that would prevent the cutting of the wood. So we set about doing that. Um, so we did calculations, and it was very obvious that with the amount of solar flux that arrives on that part of the Earth, you could very easily uh, tr uh, use the energy to cook. Right? We know how much energy it takes to cook. Some back of the envelope calculations, very easy. So we started working on that. So the NGO supplied them with these, fire, uh, these solar cookers. You can see there's nothing but, uh, it's called a butterfly design. There's two parabolic mirrors that direct the light to that cooking surface. Heats it up massively, and they can cook on it. So this is a picture of the lady uh, cooking on it. Uh, <clears throat> of course, the design failed. Uh, 
because of various obvious reasons in hindsight. First of all, they cook indoors and uh, because they're carrying the children and they're cooking sitting down, the solar cooker does not allow them to do either of those things. Uh, and they cook early in the morning and the afternoon when the sun is not shining. Uh, and they do that because the men have to go out into the fields and to, in order to go out, they need their meal. And so they have to cook early in the morning. So clearly, all of this precludes a solar cooker use as a viable design, right? Uh, so then we said, well, why not, um, instead of a solar cooker where they have to use it outside, why not build one that will store energy uh, throughout the day, and then they can cook at night and in the morning. So this is what we set out to do. And we did calculations, of course. Uh, we did a design project in our engineering um, department here, and the students were all very you know, interested in the project. And so we did all the calculations, and it turns out that you can do it. Um, but we also said, you know what? If we manufacture something from exotic materials with some uh, advanced manufacturing process, they won't be able to make it out there. Right? So we said, let's put more constraints on it. So no exotic materials, very not, you know, uh, easily available materials, no complex manufacturing, and no moving parts requiring electricity, because they don't have electricity. Correct? So those were, um, and we set ourselves a price point of $250. Okay, seemed like a good price. Uh, and so we, uh, the students designed the IHOC cooker. Um, it, you can see what it looks like. It's about 15 feet tall. Um, and um, ended up costing $500 um, and weighed about 800 pounds. So it was literally a gorilla, okay? So there is no way that it would have, you know, the design could have been scaled down to work in those little tiny homes that we were uh, interested in, in uh, putting them in. So the question, and also it was $500. So we said, okay, what is the price point that you know, people in villages would, villages would be willing to pay. So we tried this out as an intermediate measure where we went with these uh, commercially available high efficiency cook stoves. These are cook stoves that burn the wood uh, in a more efficient manner than their normal hearth, uh, cutting down wood usage by half, okay? So that's pretty good as an intermediate measure. So we gave those uh, to the villagers and made them cook with them. They were only modestly pleased with the whole device. Uh, and then eventually, we asked, so it costs about $30 to us. So we asked them, how much would you be willing to pay for this, right? Which cuts down your wood use by half, and they said about $10. So they were not even willing to pay $10 for a device that improves their life, correct? Uh, and then we, the logic was pretty clear to us. It's like, why would they pay $10 when they're paying $0 for their hearth, correct? They just get the wood and burn it. And to them, the whole issue of indoor air pollution is of little consequence. I mean, they don't really uh, view that as being their top priority, right? As long as they can cook their meals. Um, hunger, uh, as somebody said, has a very, uh, is very f uh, good at focusing your, your attention on only one thing, which is satisfying your hunger. Uh, so they don't care about all this other stuff. We care, perhaps, but they don't. So this was what we were competing against, zero dollars, correct? So that's the price point. So then we said, OK, we are left with you know, competing with a $0 thing. Why not just improve the efficiency of that hearth itself that they're using, correct? Uh, and it occurred to us that we could do that, right, by improving airflow in their hearth. And so we designed this little uh, funnel-shaped structure that had holes in it. And the idea was that uh, you could do this with scrap metal. And if you could do this and stick it in their hearth, they could actually use the wood on it, and what, what happens essentially is that the wood is on top of this, and all the ash and everything that obstructs airflow falls through, and air is able to flow effectively to the wood, and then that can improve the efficiency of the hearth, right? And it costs $1, okay? So um, just to give you an, a summary of you know, the design space, when we look at a problem, we have to look at the design space and how you know, complicated you can get with the design. So if you have... Um, a $0 hearth, the amount of wood used for a meal is, is that, right? Just to show you the magnitude of it. Um, the high efficiency cook stove, which cost $30, ended up doing that. The solar cooker, of course, cuts down wood use by quite a bit, but it will, will not work when the sun is right? not shining uh, in the winter and, in the, for example, in the uh, rainy season. It will not work. So therefore, you need some wood. And this is what the $1 uh, insert 
simple insert ends up doing. It cuts the wood use even more than the high efficiency cook stove and costs just one dollar. Okay, so uh, and we actually to make sure we tested this in a government lab in India. So it turns out that with the insert right placed right in changing nothing, uh, we get a threefold improvement in efficiency. So you know you can cut down uh, wood use by by a third. But here's the most important thing: is that the particulate matter, the uh, the uh, soot that comes out, is cut by a ten a factor of ten. So you can significantly slash the uh, soot production, right? And, and actually, uh, you know, there are, when we were working in the village, there was this whole anecdotal thing where we asked the lady of the house whether, um, you, you know, whether uh, when she ins put the insert in, whether the wood smoke was actually low or not. And uh, she claimed that it wasn't, actually. Uh, but then when we tested in the lab, it was actually reducing the, the emissions by a whole uh, tenfold decrease. So one has to test things in the lab and not just take people's word for things. So then we persuaded villagers to use it. And in that village, we supplied thousands of these units. And they started using uh, this. And, and of course, it's a global problem. Uh, everywhere, right? You see this picture of wood burning across the world. So we decided to do this in other places as well. Okay, so uh, th this is where the teaching part comes in. Uh, some of our students got uh, fellowships to go work in uh, other places. For example, uh, Alison Kindig and uh, Sharma here, uh, who were in, who are engineering students, went to Cameroon. Uh, they went to these villages. They uh, actually uh, built, uh, they worked with the villagers, villagers to build solar cookers. Uh, and uh, this was deep actually in the bush. They act, at one point they had to walk overnight to get to these, some of these villages. Um, and they worked with them to you know, bake um, uh, cakes and so on. Uh, and they designed different types of solar cookers. So you know, students, uh, and because uh, you know, on that project, Allison actually ended up with a Gates Fellowship to go to Cambridge to get a master's. And Sharma is working on a PhD, actually, in green energy in the biofuels area. So that kind of ties in with students. Uh, Sophie Malaro, who is uh, currently uh, graduating with a computer science degree, went to Ghana. And Ghana has the same situation. So uh, you can see in the market all the wood right, that's coming in for cooking. Um, and the ubiquitous goats. Whenever I see goats, I get the heebie-jeebies because they destroy everything. Uh, and then uh, you know they used, they showed them how to use these uh, inserts to cook more effectively. Uh, Ken um, uh, his, uh, and his Abhiman Foundation took on this uh, insert um, idea, and he's been actually popularizing, uh, popularizing it in Ghana, and he has a little foundation that goes into villages and supplies these and so on and so forth. So we've been working with Ken on that. Um, but in India, this whole idea of improving the hearth as well as other cook stove measures fail. They do not take, they never take hold, right? Uh, and why don't they take hold? It's not just that the technology does not work. We know how to work the technology. Right? The technology is there. Correct? It's very similar to issues in the United States, where we know that there are technologies that can solve the climate problem. Correct? But they do not take hold. Right? The most popular vehicle being driven in the United States today is the Ford F whatever, 15 or whatever, uh, the truck, correct? which is a 13, oh, whose mileage is about six, 16 MPG. While there are technologies available readily that can easily give you 40, 50 MPG, right? Uh, but why don't people use them, right? In fact, I just read that in about three, four years, uh, the American car makers are going to phase out cars in favor of trucks and, um, and SUVs, all right? Um, because there's no demand for it. So human beings are very weird, right? Uh, so we, it's, not a, it's not a technology problem. It's a human problem. <laughs> Uh, the way we think and what we value. So there are lots of thing, reasons why um, the, the cook stove problem cannot be solved in India. It's all, it, there's history involved, colonial history involved, the development mentality involved, where high tech is better than working low tech, even if the high tech doesn't work. 
right? So there's that wow factor. Lots of these kinds of things that get in the way. Um, so in fact, now the Indian government has gone all in on this problem. So they have started an initiative called Ujwala Initiative, where they are going to supply villagers, I'm talking about 50, 100 million units of LPG stoves, right? Gas stoves to the villages, um, so that they will start using gas, correct? Uh, which is already, it's, it was initiated about two, three years ago. It's already running into problems because they will supply the stove to the villagers. They will supply their first gas cylinder, but then the villagers cannot replace the gas cylinder, so now they're stuck with nothing but a stove. So this is, this is the kind of mentality, right, that gets in the way of solving real problems. Uh, and then, of course, there are deeper questions involved. One of the things that one might naively believe is that, oh, these rural people, you know, they don't have much of an education, blah, 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 so they are not really comfortable with technology or new technologies. This is totally untrue because, uh, you know, you, motorcycles are ubiquitous. Uh, you know, in a high demand, and every single person now is taking selfies in the villages. All right, uh, and uh, you know, my mom here checks her WhatsApp every single day because her friends are sending her WhatsApp uh, messages and uh, videos and so on. Keeps my kids busy. Um, so, so technology is no technology is completely acceptable to them and improves their life. So why not, right? But why not cooking technologies? Why don't cooking technologies that improve women's health? and prevent them from the daily chore of lugging 70 pounds of wood for several hours a day, why don't they catch on? Right? It has to do with lots of complex factors, one of, the, one of them being gender issues, the status of women in, as decision makers in the household. Right? And so there are lots of these. So that's why it's a multidisciplinary problem, this geography, this, there's energy and there's urban planning, all of that involved, and that's the kind of group that uh, is working on, on this. Uh, then there are other deeper questions. Uh, for example, inequities uh, in, in energy around the world and uh, the whole ethics of intervention, right? What motivates us to intervene in their lives and ask them to change? Correct, uh, and I will show you what, what the sort of uh, logical uh, an ethical dilemma there is. So if you look around the world and ask how much energy is being used, uh, in the United States, that's of course a big dot there, we use 100 light bulbs worth of uh, power, right? So as we are sitting here, each of us, um, there are, there are, we are burning 100 light bulbs constantly, day in, day out, 365, right? Uh, if you look at Africa, particularly sub-Saharan Africa, one light bulb, okay, worth of power. Uh, in India, in, when you average over the entire country, it's about four. But that includes about 700 million of people with one light bulb people and about 100 million city dwellers who are almost at American levels. Okay? Uh, and um, SUVs are very popular in India, by the way, even though the roads can't fit them. Um, so, and of course, in, in uh, East Asia, it's about 25 light bulbs, okay, on average. So you see the the vast disparity in energy use, correct? So here I am, I'm flying in from here, right? I'm flying in from here on an airplane, okay? Just flying, the act of flying from here to this area has already meant that I used energy equivalent to one year's worth of energy use of a person in, in the village. And I'm telling them to stop burning wood, right? So that struck me at about the third trip. It's like, this is completely insane. Um, so you know, we are asking these people here in the remote hills to change while their energy intensity is here. The people in the cities, even in India, are way up there. And we're asking them to cut, stop cutting wood. right? Um, and that means that we have to have some self-awareness, correct? And this is how developing countries, develop, people in developed countries like us have to relate to this problem in developing countries. Some perspective, right? We're asking them to stop cutting their forests. And in fact, there's a whole UN program called RED, uh, and RED Plus, it's, it's a later variant, I don't know if you're aware of this, where people in developed, or developed nations pay developing nations to stop deforestation, okay? so. 
some self-awareness that this little eight-year-old that went with me to on that walk and was bringing back a wood bundle on her head uses one light bulb while I am a T-Rex because I am a my footprint is that and her footprint is that. Right? So how, what right do I have of telling her to stop cutting wood, just to cook her meals? Right? Uh, so this is a perspective that we are trying to inject into students, because they need to have this perspective. Because it is a globally connected world. Right? We may not think that, at least at the moment, in the last year or so. But we are in a globally connected world through things like climate processes. Okay? So, how do we bring that to Iowa students? So we have actually been teaching a course on this. Uh, you know, we've been working on this for several years. We met initially to try to think about how we can introduce this into the curriculum. And we uh, teach a course uh, with 90 student, about 90 students a semester um, on, uh, called People and the Environment. It's a big ideas course uh, on intersections of technology, culture, and social justice. Uh, and, and bringing out all these, and we use this particular uh, project that we're working on as a centerpiece around which we build the course and the curriculum. Uh, we also had an international conference that we organized last year on this problem to highlight the issue, uh, and uh, Jerry uh, Anthony organized that. Um, and we've been taking students to India. I, I, I take them in the winter uh, to go visit these villages. Uh, some of these students had never left Iowa. Some of them had never been on an airplane before. But now they're in rural India interacting with villagers. They're also having fun. We make sure that they get some tourism in because it's a very area that's very rich in history uh, and um, or, you know, cuisine and all that stuff. But the most important thing is that they actually sit with the villagers and talk. Right? And we have a translator, um, but they're actually interacting with, with people on the ground right? and learning about their problem. We had the villagers kind of draw their own pictures of environmental issues and so on and so forth. Um, and the students actually communicate through that. They also communicated through an interpreter of the local language and, and really taking people uh, on to the field. Um, and we also had, uh, then got a grant to take graduate students and undergraduates on a, a study tour. Uh, Meena Khandelwal was a director of that. Um, we've gotten more faculty. Uh, Paul Grino, who is emeritus right now, is a South Asian history. Um, uh, was his area of expertise, uh, just an amazing storehouse of knowledge. Uh, and so, you know, again, introducing uh, students, they had Indian um, um, scholars and activists and so on come and speak at a conference we organized in India. I, you know, had people uh, go to their homes in India and sort of experience the culture and life and so on. So. Blending in the teaching, research, and, and service uh, into the multidisciplinary problem of food, water, energy nexus. And then now what we are doing is we have, so the solar cooker initiative failed. The Mewarangiti, the, the little device that we had, has succeeded to some extent in Kenya and Ghana, but not in India. And now we are thinking, remember these images that I showed of burning um, fields the woman cooking with the firewood and pollution in New Delhi. We, are, we began to uh, write, a, write some proposals. Uh, these are sort of things we're sending out to various places to try to solve, see if we can solve these problems by linking them. And here's one very natural way to do this that ha comes from a lot of experience in Iowa, actually. Why not take all of this stubble and instead of burning it, why not convert that into biofuel pellets? Right? You can convert that into biofuel fuel pellets, which means that there will be opportunities for people in the rural areas to actually get some commercial value out of the waste. Right? Convert that and then use it in a clean burning, what's called a biogas, biomass gasifier stove. So this is a very simple construction stove uh, and utilizes some airflow mixing and so on and so forth to get clean burning flames. And these are you know, as clean as any you would get on your own gas stove at home. Uh, and what the waste that comes out of that is not soot, but char. Right? And one could take the char and put it back on the fields, which is one of the reasons why they burn the fields anyway, because it's, it enriches the carbon. So take the carbon and enrich the fields and use that 
the commercial value of all of that to supply these the stoves to the villagers, correct? And they wouldn't have to buy another cylinder, nothing to do, right? Except they would have to buy the pellets on a regular basis, correct? And then now what, what will all of that do? It will prevent the burning of this agricultural waste, which means that it will solve the problem of pollution in Delhi. Right, so that's the nexus that we want to establish. Now, there are lots of problems here. One of the huge problems is maintaining a supply chain. Correct? Somehow there has to be a supply, manufacturing as well as supply chain. There are already manufacturers of pellets in the areas where the burning is happening. So that industry is already well established. There are already people on the ground doing this in India. It's just a matter of figuring out how to link them in, um, um, in a system or in a setting that not only maintains the supply chain, but also has economic value. Because without economics, nothing will work. Right? So that's the problem that we're working on right now, is to try to tie all of these things in. Um, so, but why should we care? You know, we are in a nice, beautiful, clean air environment, uh, at least so far. Um, so why should we care? Right? Um, one of the things that we should, we should care because of this picture, and I show this graphic because it's much more, I think, um, uh, endures in our minds more than a dumb sort of... Um, so this is the Earth's temperature. Um, it's a GIF from NASA. It shows the evolution of the Earth's temperature over this century. So where we are heading is uh, to about a 1.5 degree centigrade above what it used to be in the past, pre-industrial. And the danger zone is 2 degree centigrade. That is, at 2 degree centigrade, bad things can start happening. At 1.5 itself, people argue that it's not a James Hansen, for example, who is a former Iowa alum, right? Another stalwart uh, in the climate change area, argues that 1.5 degree centigrade itself is too much, but let's give some leeway. So um, we want, we are heading towards that, right? And that's the global thing. It's nobody is going to escape that. That's Iowa included. So uh, what does that mean? Just to kind of give a perspective on what that particular limit means. It means that if we continue business as usual, that is keep burning fossil fuels and so on, use energy the way we do, we are heading towards, at the end of century, about four or five degrees centigrade temperature change, which is, which is catastrophic. That's not even, uh, let's not even go there. One cannot imagine what would happen in that situation. But if we follow the path that of reduction of uh, fossil fuels and so on and are responsible, uh, we have a chance of ending up at about 1.5 degrees centigrade or hopefully not more than that by end of century. What does that mean? That means that the amount of, we can easily calculate this, the amount of total carbon that can go in the atmosphere before that limit is hit is about 790 gigatons of carbon, correct? At that point, we hit 1.5. So what does that amount to? Uh, or why, why are we interested in this two degree centigrade limit? Because it has, you know, people can do modeling or you can go back in time and show that when you hit two degree centigrade, all sorts of bad things start happening, right? Uh, for example, the coral reefs start dissolving. Uh, glaciers are already on their way out, but those, those are gonna go away. Uh, and there's a whole other story of what glaciers going away is going to do to water supply in India and agriculture, but that's a different day. Um, and then, uh, you know, you, we're going to lose sea ice, which sets off what's called a uh, feedback loop. It's an ice feedback loop. Uh, the Greenland ice will start melting, and the West Antarctic ice sheet will start disintegrating. So there's a lot of ice loss that's going to happen, even at the range in which we are heading, right? That's, we are already heading there. We are locked in for 1.5. Um, and, of course, that will have an impact on agriculture and rainfall and so on, particularly in the Corn Belt, right? Uh, and these are pr projections from various models. Um, some of them are more severe, some of them are not. But one of the things that they maintain is that by mid-century or so, we start seeing dryness in where we are, in Iowa, okay? So it's going to impact crop. <clears throat> but even more, uh, sort of remarkably, so this is the total budget, right? At 790, we hit 2 degrees centigrade. 
uh, what that what this means is the following that so far we've used up uh, the this part of the budget the green part right we have already put in 515 gigatons of carbon in the atmosphere so what is left is this 270 we can still put 275 without exceeding the limit all right now uh, just take uh, this perspective here. So the amount remaining is 275 gigatons of carbon. If we burn all our fossil fuel that's currently known reserves and put that carbon in the air, we, we will be putting 2,795 gigatons of carbon, which is 10 times that amount. So what does that mean? It means that we can only burn 10% of the fossil fuels that are in the ground. Right? Now try telling an oil and gas company that story. That they have to leave 90% of their reserves under the ground. Because the amount in dollars of reserves in the ground is about $30 trillion. Not billion, a trillion dollars. Right? So ask them to leave that in the ground. It's not going to happen, right? So what does that mean? It means that. If you look at that 790 gigatons of carbon budget, this is all that has been spent by generations before our parents. This is our parents used that up, right? In the last 20 years, right, we have used this, okay? And in the next 20 years, we, you and I, in our lifetime, we're gonna use that. That leaves that much budget for our kids. This is the sliver that our kids can use, correct? This is the next generation. This is my kids can use that. What kind of life will they have with that amount of energy, right? So why does it matter? It matters because we're putting carbon in the air. In any which way we can to cut carbon in the air, we have to do that, right? And people are already talking. Bill Gates has already set up companies that are designed to suck carbon out of the air. Correct. The absurdity that we saw, the water cannon absurdity, is exactly, is, is a direct parallel on a different scale to pulling carbon out of the air. Okay. So in fact, it is very curious. One of my very scientifically uh, illiterate friends and a really thinking person said, you know what? We pulled nitrogen out of the air and made uh, um, useful things, for example, nitrogen fertilizers. Correct. Wouldn't this not be similar? I said, well, what percentage of air is nitrogen? Right? And what percentage of the air is carbon, uh, carbon dioxide? Carbon dioxide is point, used to be 270 parts per million of air. It's a small, teeny tiny tr trace, right? Most of air is nitrogen. It's very easy to pull nitrogen out, but it's very, very difficult to put car pull carbon out of the air because it's a trace gas. It's not the same thing, right? It, this, this technology fixes are so tantalizing, but when you actually delve deep into them, you realize that they're fraught with problems. So, but I want to make the connection to water. When asked if what, if anything, the villagers would want, they said water, not I want a stove, I want a television. We asked them, do you want a television? Okay, and they said, no, we don't want a television. We want water. So why water? Because on the other side of the hill where they are is this, bona fide desert. And desertification is rampant, okay? So more and more of the land is lost to desert. It's right there, right on the edge where they are. Right, and if you look, and this is, I go back to Norman Burlog. Norman Borlaug did a great thing, right? Made India self-sufficient in, in food. However, there are always unintended consequences. One of the unintended consequences of the Green Revolution is huge amount of groundwater being sucked out of the ground to irrigate, correct? So if you look at where the water tables are in India, now you have to go a kilometer or so to get water in many of these areas in the agricultural heartland, correct? And that's a lot of electrical power to get the water out of the ground, which comes from coal burning power plants. So agriculture is very intimately, and water is very intimately tied in with the energy problem. 
right? If you don't have coal, then you cannot get water for agriculture. So if you look at where, this is New Delhi right there, where the problems are. And this is the neighboring agricultural states, Punjab, Haryana. This is where most of the Indian agriculture, uh, uh, agricultural output comes from. Very highly intense uh, green revolution areas, right? Lots of water distress, OK? Uh, and of course, there's water distress in the south again, uh, where there's a lot of agric intense agriculture. Right? Look at the number of water pumps. So these are, this is a map of the electrical water pumps in India. Where is the electricity coming from? Coal. The worst kind of coal, so the different kinds of coal. Right? India has the worst, some of the worst kind of coal, All right? brown coal. So that's what's being, being burned and thrown into the atmosphere. So they're all tied in. The food, water, energy nexus is very, very tight. So why is it? Why should we connect with the developing world? Why does it matter? We can be happy here in Iowa. Plenty of corn, plenty of land, very clean air, not so clean water. right? Um, so because we have the knowledge and the know-how, and that's one of the things that we, as an interdisciplinary group, are working on is to transmit that and work with Indian scholars and, and field workers, particularly in the food, water, energy area. Uh, we are a bellwether region for transition from agriculture to other forms of economy. So whatever has happened in uh, Iowa, for example, the flight to urban areas, right? The, uh, I mean, we've seen this on farms, young people moving out. Um, the average age of Iowa farmers is something like 69, 70 years. Uh, more women farmers. Now half the f Iowa farms are owned by women. Right, um, And so those kinds of things are happening in India as well. There's a flight from the farms. So those kinds of transitions, uh, Iowa, we, we know how to deal with those kinds of transitions. right? Uh, so that's something that we can actually share with the world. Uh, there's, of course, self-interest. Simply the climate change impacts themselves, correct, uh, are going to affect us eventually. And uh, pure humanitarian interest, just being interested in other human beings. So that's sort of my take on connecting Iowa to the developing world. Thank you. I'll take any questions. The villagers? Um, it's, it's sort of you know mixed, I would say. Uh, for first, uh, vi vi villagers in India are used to NGOs now. There are about 2 million NGOs in India alone. Right? So there's a lot of this NGO activity going on in one way or the other. So they've seen a lot of this. And this particular villages we go to, the NGO has been operating there for a very long time. So they're kind of used to them. So they, we get filtered in through that process or grandfathered in in some ways. Um, they are you, typically these villagers when we go, villages when we go to them, they are the most inviting, welcoming, cheerful, happy, carefree people. So I mean, not to idealize their, their lot. It's just that they are very simple folk, right? So to them, we are almost curiosities. Precisely, you know, so they are very, in that sense, we are welcome in the sense that we are a distraction from their daily life. OK. Uh, on the other hand, they don't expect much, much out of us, in the sense that they, they've seen people come and go and have had no impact on their lives. Mm -hmm. And while we assume that we are actually going to make a difference in their lives, they already harbor the assumption that mm -hmm. these guys are here, it's fun, let's watch what they're doing. Yeah. Right? Uh, very little meaningful stuff happens eventually by interventions where people fly in, helicopter in, to use the phrase, and helicopter out. Uh, there are lots of Indian NGOs who are doing really awesome work because they stay there. They're, they're committed to the cause, and they're doing this for no money for a very, very long time. So that's the kind of, so for us, it's 
I, when I look at it, I am much more interested in exposing students in, from Iowa to that part of the world and having them see that than I have any impression that I'm going to make a dent in their lives. So it's mixed, like everything else. Sorry. What was the resistance? To, uh, was there resistance to the um, funnel, the metal funnel grate, and what was the what was it that the builders didn't like about it? Well, there are there was two two sources of resistance. One source was that we could never get the government of India, or Indian NGOs or anybody up in the echelon to pay attention to it because it was not a attractive high-tech option. It was a very low-tech. People couldn't make money off of it. There was no economic value. You know, It was just not something that anybody wanted to. They didn't feel it was like no big deal. Who cares anyway? I mean, it's going to cut down their emissions by a, ten, by a factor of 10. It costs nothing, but why do I care? Yeah, so it's, you know, it, it, only, it only matters when you can actually make it uh, pay somebody some money, right? That's one thing. Second thing, the government of India has pushed for high efficiency cook stove for over 30 years now with very little success, so they're jaded. In fact, that's one thing that prompted them to go towards this whole gas stove initiative in the first place. And in fact, they did not want to encourage any impediments to their latest gas stove push. So we met many, many roadblocks. That's, for, for that reason, actually, in Ghana and Kenya, where none of that scenario exists, uh, it has received a much better reception, and people are pushing that. Uh, the other thing is, in India, India differs from, rural India even, actually, differs from perhaps some areas of uh, Africa and so on. Because uh, in rural India now, there is better connectivity with the uh, urban spaces, right? So they see what the urban dwellers are doing. They, they know that they have motorcycles and cell phones, and they can download MP3, whatever, correct? And so the villagers now can do all of that stuff. And they have you know, access to television in some places, or radio, or whatever. So they know what's going on in the outside world. So they, don't, they want what like, the Joneses have. So they don't want to be stuck with this little device that improves their airflow a little bit. It's not. They, they want a middle class, what the middle class people have. Oh, yes. I was wondering about the pellets. Uh, I know in Iowa, we, we live in biomass pellets even at the university. But do they, will they need like tractors and gas power tractors? To Uh, yes, they will need all sorts of um, infrastructure to make that happen. And they started doing that? Oh, yes, yes. There, no, there, there, is, there are pellet manufacturers out there. They're doing that. They haven't done it to the scale that needs to be done. So it's a matter of figuring out if that can happen to scale. So it's more of a, it, it's not so much, it's not, now this is a technology problem. It's all about um, you know, um, resource management and supply chain management and those kinds of things. So it's a very um, how, you know, nuts and bolts problem. Yeah, similar. I was I'm familiar with the um, biomass project here. And it's, that's one of the things we're working on right now for our own, our own power plant is pelletizing right. um, this campus and right. some other things. And, um, I, I think there it would be much more Local, well, same here. It's much more of a local market. We're trying to um, you know, get our fuel supply within a. Right. Yes. Oh. I'm just curious. How did you market it when you went in there? Did you did you use a when you went in was it a health marketing to these women or was it a you know this is going to help the world kind of thing was it how did you do that yeah, we went purely from the health point of view purely from the health so then my thought was I I I'm not I, why not like a chimney just out of curiosity oh chimneys have been tried in India for decades and they just don't work 
just don't, they haven't worked at all for a very long time. Um, and there are many reasons for that. Uh, one of the reasons is chimneys, in the rainy season, the, the water comes in through the chimneys. That irritates them. Secondly, um, the, there are snakes. And snakes come in through the chimneys. So that irritates them. So there are lots of chimneys have been tried and, and given up for decades now. It's, it seems like the most no-brainer solution, actually. And it has been tried. Yeah. They, didn't do, they didn't like it. In fact, they don't like any openings like that. They don't even have windows, really. Because they're afraid of lots of things. I mean, primarily uh, animals. But their air looked very fresh out in the country. It was when you showed pictures of New Delhi. That's where it, the impact is. Right. Their outdoor air is very fresh, but their indoor air is not. In their New Delhi, it's... Not. But they can walk outside and it's all fresh. Oh, of course. Whereas it's in awesome. Delhi, it's not. No, no, not at all. Interesting. They have the opposite problem, yeah. Thank you so Thank much you. Yeah. for contributing today. And um, thank you all for coming. Please go to the website to find out um, who the next uh, speakers will be. And we welcome you to come back in about a month. Thank you. Thank you.